Welcome to Speak the Truth. My name is Gary Johnson, the publisher of BlackMenInAmerica.com. Today is April 3rd, 2022. And I got to tell you, tomorrow is the anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. I wow. just That just came up on my in my brain. But another thing that we want to talk about, we can talk about that maybe on another show or later, 50 years, maybe even 50 plus years of inside sports with DC legend Harold Bell, who was the host of our show with his co-host CJ. And Mr. Bell, I'm telling you, 50 years, that's longer than some of the people on the panel have been alive. <laughs> you all have had toy parties, fashion fairs, raising money for underprivileged kids, you and your wife, Hattie. Uh, you're known throughout the city and, and throughout the country and in some areas throughout the world, you're known. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Harold Bell. Yeah, thank you, Gary. And uh, welcome to everyone that's here on Speak the Truth. Yeah, 50 years, this uh, 1972 to 2022 20, is 50 years. That's when I started Inside Sports uh, talk show in February of 1972. And I can't believe that I'm sitting here, you know, talking and, and dealing with another uh, a media outlet as we continue in this struggle. Uh, 50 plus years of uh, Kids in Trouble. I found Kids in Trouble in 1968, and Gary, you just brought up, that's when we lost our Prince of Peace, the Dr. Martin Luther King. So 50, was this, 53 years, Gary? And this is my 50, the 53rd anniversary. I went to DC. I went to DC Public School. Let me see here. I got to carry the one. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm kids that y'all found kids in trouble the year that Dr. Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated, December of 1968. That's when I found kids in trouble. So I've been out here 50 plus years with kids in trouble, man. And, uh, it has been. It's been a struggle, but I enjoyed every minute of it trying to help our young people and the people that supported me. This was not a one-man community action program, as Washingtonian Magazine once described me. It took a, it took, uh, it really took a village, and that's what I come. I come from a village, a village in Washington D.C. in the D.M.V. period. And today I'm, I met uh, about a month ago, the C.I.W.A tournament came back to Baltimore and that's you know where Big House Gaines went to school a legendary coach my coach at Winston-Salem and the CIAA left the south man really even though this is the south they left the south where all the schools are and came to Baltimore which I think is a fabulous place man to have the CIAA tournament so anyway I decided to take a ride over there to catch Winston-Salem, but I end up uh, at this uh, seminar, man, where I encountered some brilliant Black people, man, and uh, it really was very fulfilling, and I met this young man that I'm getting ready to introduce now, come to find out uh, he's a native Washingtonian, uh, doing some great things over in Baltimore, as well as in PG County and D.C., and uh, we got to talking, man, and I was very, very impressed with him. Let me read, uh, uh, tell you a little bit about this young man, Dante Tyler. He's an unconventional cybersecurity professional from Prince George's County, Maryland. He's a college dropout, believes that success in the tech industry does not have to be traditional. With over eight years of experience in the tech industry supporting various federal agencies, Dante has be begun to distinguish himself as a premier advocate for GRC data privacy and security awareness training. In 2018, he founded OQP Solutions and called a consulting firm geared toward assisting small business owners to close security gaps Dante currently holds several I'm sorry, certifications and certifications, including CISM Security Plus, CDPSE, and CEH. Dante's unconventional cyber 
awareness, training, and education, teaching methods seeking to educate the everyday user and challenge the most experienced tech professionals on the involve, involving uh, cyber vulnerability. To inquire about more information, you can email him at info at OQP. Without further ado, I would like to welcome my man, Dante Taylor. How you doing, Dante? <laughs> um, that that's the that that introduction always just takes me back that I've that I'm here, man. But thank you for the beautiful introduction, Mr. Herb. Well, hey, Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. Tell us about what what you're doing in cybersecurity, because those of us who are sitting here, we've been talking about how senior citizens are being ripped off all over the country. You told me, I thought it was close to $2 billion, but you told me they're losing $2.6 billion each year. Senior citizens are being ripped off, and there's been no help out there for them. I mean, we had to get on AARP about them not having a department for scams, you know, for scams, for senior citizens able to call and get a, a direct department. And I couldn't understand that because AARP is racking up plenty of money. Uh, they should be able to afford a security department. And we're being ripped off by doctors. We're being ripped off by banks. We're being ripped off by car dealerships. You name it. And I have been ripped off myself. I, I you know, I had a doctor uh, who, who dismissed me from his business because he was overcharging me and allowed another insurance company to come in over my um, over my, my medical insurance that I had, man. He go, and his people don't tell him that, hey, my wife is there. She still got the same medical insurance. Why do you think that I would want to twist over to this company, Kaiser Permanente, I'm going to tell you, all of a sudden, he has them on the rolls, and all of a sudden, he charged me $174 for each visit. So, man, you know, I didn't like that. So I wrote him a letter, and he dismissed me and my wife, Dr. Peter Swaby is his name, in Bowie, Merle. So, I'm, you know, I'm saying, man, that we need what you're doing because we're being ripped off not only by, you know, those folks that I just called out, but we're being ripped across, and the seniors, man, don't have a no clue on where to go. So bring us up to date on what you're doing, Dante. Uh, I'm sorry that I apologize, and I'm sorry that that, that occurred to you, Mr. Hurl. Uh, this yeah. is why it's important for me to shed light on this uh, important subject within cybersecurity. And I wanted to apologize to the panel and everyone who's watching. I had every intention on getting home and being in my house doing this interview, but uh, my cousin, my little cousin, it was her 10th birthday at Cheesecake Factory. Uh, mm -hmm. Happy birthday, Layla. Happy 10th birthday. Your big cuz love you. Mm -hmm. um, and I needed to charge my car. So I'm sitting at the supercharger right. station now, and uh, I wasn't able to get home. But um, Mr. Harold, uh, this, this, this senior citizen cyber hygiene is... Uh, it's, it's of the utmost importance. Um, if you if you just take inventory of society and you see where if you follow the money, as they say, most of the most of the money follows the boomers. These are uh, older individuals, such as some of the panel that we have on uh, here today, as well as, um, you know, of your friends. They have the bulk of the money. So the criminals, the attackers know this. Um, and senior citizens are one of the most vulnerable groups of Internet users who are prone to cyber attacks. And this results from the fact that they just have limited cybersecurity training. Um, cybersecurity awareness and training involves educating Internet users on cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities that should in turn reduce their likelihood of a successful attack. Um, as Mr. Harrow hinted, or hit on prior to bringing me on, um, $2.6 billion is stolen from um, people over the age of 65. That is around 39.5 million people in the U.S. currently. Um, of that 40, of that 39.5 million people that are over the age of 65, 40% of them are women and 40% of them live at home alone. So imagine you're 65 years old, you know, you've retired, you're successful, 
you've made investments, you live alone, and you don't you have you have little to no cybersecurity training on how to defend yourself, but yet your grandson, your daughter, or your your um your grandkids, they're giving you these smart devices for your birthday, for your holiday, and no one is giving you adequate training on how to identify indicators of compromise. Indicators of compromise are fancy words for someone is trying to steal your personal identity, which is the number one threat for senior citizens is identity theft, because again, they have the bulk of the money right now in the world. Um, they've been here the longest right now, so <laughs> they have a lot of the money. Um, Senior citizens living at home alone is very dangerous. Uh, this is why, like I said, I'm here to highlight um, cybersecurity awareness. But before I dive in, I wanted to hear some stories about um, Mr. Harold, maybe uh, some of your experiences of being um, your, your, maybe you've been cyber attack or any of the panel has anyone ever experienced a cyber attack? Anybody? I have an experience with cyber attack. Jacques, go ahead, Jacques. Yeah, I, I have uh, a couple times I've had my bank account attacked. I, I guess that's considered to be cyber attack. I've had my email account hacked uh, uh, once. Each time it got into my bank account, there was only, it was less than $1,000, thankfully, and I was able to get the bank to recoup the money each time. Uh, and, and it really traumatized me because actually the first time it happened about 12 years ago, I thought it was my son. There was somebody that ordered video games. And then come to find out that my son, you know, didn't even own a, a play two station. So he wouldn't have had no need uh, to order these games. And then another time, uh, uh, about four or five months ago, they hacked my email. I couldn't even get into my own email for about a week and took expenditure forever to straighten it up uh, to allow me to get back in and, and uh, you know, communicate through uh, email uh, 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 tr uh, transactions, you know, uh, correspondence. But uh, so that was some of the worst things that happened to me that comes to mind. That's unfortunate. Can I ask you, have you ever in your life received any cyber awareness training or education? I have not, other than what I pick up on uh, uh, TV sometimes and uh, uh, what have you. And uh, there's a lady who I just asked to join today, uh, Miss Bree who works with the Pentagon and she may be able to offer us some insight uh, as well. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Bri, I already told you work at the Pentagon now, too late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always well, dry snitching. That's what she's gonna say when she take her uh, uh, mic off. But anyway, uh, no, oh, I can y'all hear any... me now? Yeah, yeah well, okay. Yeah, I can hear okay. you, baby. Hi. Okay. Hey. Your secret safe with us. On. <laughs> <laughs> you tell them again, Bree. They didn't hear you. I had to put some clothes on. Oh, my we gracious. appreciate that. <laughs> oh, have mercy. That's TMI, girl. See, so you need some cyber training too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, I'm gonna be quiet, Dante. Because no, it's okay. Um, I'm go back on mute. But, but I, I asked that question because I, I, uh, a large percentage. I want to say. From my experience, I would say 80 to 85 percent of people over the age of 65 have never received security awareness training. And if they have, it's only because their job mandated them to do it in order to use a computer, which right. most organizations um, do require. So I just wanted to go over some common threats that our senior citizens are faced with. And then I wanted to just give some simple yet effective techniques to mitigate these risks or bring your uh, cybersecurity risk down to acceptable levels. So some common threats that senior citizens are faced with are more, more often than not, we see psychological attacks or scams on elderly uh, people, uh, people calling impersonating to be uh, the IRS or a government agency um, asking for money or donations. And um, as you know, senior citizens have empathy. So criminals tend to prey on that as well as the loneliness of senior citizens. Um, oftentimes senior citizens are, uh, they use dating or wrong, uh, they are susceptible to dating and romance scams. Um, 
they're also susceptible to like medications or like I said, donations for false charities. Um, attackers create fake websites, create you anything you can think of a, that's online. An attacker can create a fake portal um, that is geared to steal your personal information. Um, impersonation is another one. Identity theft is the biggest one. Stealing a baby's boomer, social security number, address, name, purse, anything with PII is of uh, it's it's on the it's at the top for them. It's you guys are low-hanging fruit. You don't know, you have limited cybersecurity training. Um, so it's just like open season. So some tips to help my senior citizens reduce their risk of acceptable levels is the first one is no one will ever call you and ask for your personal information. So this right. includes your social security number, um, your banking information, your bank will not call you and say, hey, what is your account number? We need your social security number. Um, I think mm -hmm. as young people, I have a grandmother, I have a grandfather. I We have to educate them in a way that is not complex. Cybersecurity is already a complex field. It involves a bunch of fancy, I, I call them fancy words, but big words that mean all of the same thing. So at OQPS, we like to simplify cybersecurity and just give it to you in a digestible small pieces. So um, I tell, I would suggest senior citizens, and I don't usually suggest this, but there are benefits if like an Alexa app or uh, Siri, Senior citizens can rely on these AI, artificial intelligent machines, to set reminders, set timers, set schedules. Um, this will always help keep them somewhat uh, safe. Uh, there's no 100% way to stay safe online. I want to highlight that as well. You can only reduce your risk to acceptable levels. Um, one of the last things I want to leave you guys with is if it doesn't feel right, the X is to the right. Um, when we go into, um, when I go into senior citizen homes, because I teach one of my, one of the niche areas for my company is cybersecurity awareness and training. When we go into these senior citizen homes, um, we always, always, always stress the importance of um, repetition. You know, you can't just come to this one class and think that, you know, you're defended against all attacks. You know, you have to keep building upon this information. So um, those are just a few tips I wanted to leave you with. Um, if anyone needs any more information, um, I could be reached at oqpsolutions.com. Um, and if anyone has any questions on the panel, I'd be gladly to answer. Uh, I just know we have, a good, we have a good show here today. I just wanted to go over a quick overview um, of the problem um, and highlight some key information and, and statistics, and then also give you guys some countermeasures to defend against these attacks. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bree, since you're the new girl on the block, we're gonna, we're gonna let you, if you got any questions uh, for our, our presenter here, Bree? I'm not for sure what you guys are talking about, but I heard cybersecurity and right. um, the training and stuff in. And basically at the Pentagon, yes, we are required once a year to um, to do our cybersecurity training. And, and it's important. And if you don't do it, they can cut your computer completely off. So that's how important it is. So, um, I mean, I'm getting, I'm listening and getting a little bit more into yeah, Bri, what you guys me, are talking hey, Bri, about. Well, let, me, let me kind of bring you up to date. Just, uh, a lot of senior citizens are being scammed out here. I mean, they right. are the number one target. And they and this brought to my attention. I thought it was close to two billion, but Dante says two point six billion dollars that they're being scammed out every year. And I'm a I have been scammed. I've been scammed by my bank. I've been scammed by dental insurance. I've been scammed mm -hmm. by my car insurance. They that I cut them off to take get better insurance, and they tell me I, I stayed on a day too late, and they go charge me another month. They do all of this to senior citizens because we don't know. But, but one thing, Bree, we got a lot of us belong to AARP. And AARP, right. I mean, they take care. I mean, they got so much money, Bree. They do not have a, a scamming department where seniors can call and say, hey, I need some help. 
And, right. And as many of us know on here, we stayed on ARP so long that they finally put uh, a, a commercial and promo on WHUR radio talking mm -hmm. about scams. So people yeah. are listening and people need help. So that's what the show is about. This portion of the show is about, we're talking about you have, you know, a feel for what's going on in your job. And we just wanted to get your expertise. Today. Yeah. And another, and another way that the hackers got in is through OPM when they had like their breach um, and a lot of the hackers got into OPM because I get letters all the time saying my social security number and everything has been, um, you know, compromised uh, com and whatever, but um, compromised. Compromised. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and um, as far as the AARP thing, y'all got to renew mine. Shoot. Yeah, but I was, um, but you're right, AARP, um, they don't have that protection and stuff like that. But, That's um, right. So that's why I don't, I guess that's why I didn't renew because, uh, well, they don't really ask for a whole bunch of personal information anyway. It's what you right. give them. So, mm -hmm. but as far as like um, the hackers, most of them are coming in through OPM, you know, um, the credit bureaus and everything. They want you to put a freeze on your credit. But if you do that, that's going to mess you up. So what's the difference? So, um, but, but like I said, I get emails, mail everything just just saying that um uh, you know that my my social security number and and all this other stuff so i've been i've been hacked but so far i mean they're not getting nothing i mean they right. can go to my bank account maybe they'll put something in there for me. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 other than that i mean i don't i don't think it's a way out here now that they pretty much can stop it because if they can get through opm mm -hmm. and they can't stop it then how are we going to stop it? I mean, the hackers, people get paid to hack. You know, they get paid to hack and they do it so well. Who, I mean, how are we going to stop them? There's right. there's no stopping. I don't think there's no way of stopping hackers. So, no, there's no way I we mean, can stop them, but we can reduce our risk to acceptable levels. And yeah. that all that means is you understand the threats and vulnerabilities that exist on the internet and you take yeah. proactive steps to ensure that the likelihood of or success of that attack is very low. Yeah. Um, we this is this is like if you're getting in a car, you can't 100 percent circumvent a car crash. Mm -hmm. There's right. no way you there's no way you can. Um, I, my, my as an advocate for security awareness training, it's my job to um, raise awareness and, and raise awareness for cybersecurity training and at the core of it, change the culture of the way us as a society looks at this computer, this device that we're all using now. Every, mm -hmm. It's more than just you're getting in, you're getting on Amazon and purchasing a new blender. You know, this yeah. is a new world. This is, you know, this isn't the the mugger or the the guy who used to rob you on the street with the 38 snub nose. He doesn't need a gun anymore. You know, he just needs a laptop with the internet connection and a mm. few tools and he can steal your information. Um, data is the new gold. So uh, protect it with your life, you know. Um, they can really just go on Facebook because I because I mean, yeah, I post stuff on Facebook, but I don't I know what to post and what not to post. I look at some people's profiles. They have everything, everything they there. do. Yeah, they have that's... where they used to work, where they work yeah. now, yep. all that other stuff and lines of stuff. And then these questions is going around on Facebook, like what was your name, your last car or what did yep. you do last? And all that <laughs> stuff is just for the hackers you just mm -hmm. when you answer those questions or what your friends are posting it's just it's for the hackers uh oh my computer is trying to restart um mm -hmm. all they're doing is just giving the hackers information about you you see um if i'm a friend with jock and another friend request come in from jock that's a hacker if i accept that that hacker is already into all my information and all my friends and everything else so they go in and then they find information because so we pretty much give the hackers information ourselves, basically. So, I mean, yeah, that's called open source intelligence, where yeah. I can use a Internet resource such as Google, white pages, Facebook, mm -hmm. um, and just uh, start to build a profile. Um, yeah. attack, attackers, they have a methodology. Um, it's just mm -hmm. like anything else. I want to know who you are. I want to know how much money 
you made last year. If, if mm -hmm. you're a business, I want to know how much cyber insurance that you have. I want to yeah. know um, when do you even have a cyber awareness training? So they build a profile on you. And mm -hmm. I always highlight to my clients, um, always reduce the amount of information that you share online. You want to make it as I call it defense and death. You want to make it as tough for this attacker so that he just has to keep opening doors and keep opening mm -hmm. doors to get to something. Most of yeah. them are lazy. They want easy access um, and low hanging fruit. So don't be mm -hmm. the low hanging fruit. Don't be the low hanging fruit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Brother Lawrence, Brother Lawrence. Lawrence. Take yourself yeah. off mute. Yeah, you have to unmute oh, himself. Let me, let me unmute myself right here. Okay. Yeah, wow. I'm trying to cut down the noise. Um, I've been uh, hacked one time, and somebody in Atlanta, Georgia, was um, taking money out of my checking account. And it, the, I didn't even really know it. My bank called me and told me, hey, look, uh, there's some peculiar things going on with your account that we noticed, mm -hmm. and we want to know if um, you're cashing checks and buying things in Atlanta, Georgia, because uh, we don't see you traveling, and we see you're still in a certain location in New Jersey, and we have questions about someone taking money out of your account in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, they straightened it out. They replaced the money that was in there and they went after the hackers. Mm -hmm. That That's probably one of the most uh, used methods um, to get into people's accounts. And I think that's a major part of the hacking of uh, people's checking accounts, uh, people's uh, insurance like you indicated and um, through your hospitalization and things like that. So um, I'm very well aware of it. I was going to ask you another question, but it would take kind of off the combat. Take you. I'm hearing on TV about how we should be concerned about what's going on in Russia. And Russia is in the process of um, very soon uh, doing some cyber attacks on, on the U.S. government. How does that major international connection, how would that impact on someone like ourselves? Well, that is a great question. And a high level overview answer will be when you release a cyber attack from like a, a, a digital device, I don't have control over what it affects. So I may have been targeting this particular server, but if that server has any connection to anything else, and this is a vulnerability that's a zero day, and IT we call a zero day uh, vulnerability is a vulnerability you do not know about. You don't, you have no recollection of. So if, if they're able to infiltrate our government um, information systems, especially as high up as some of these agencies that uh, have visibility into a lot of different industries and uh, things, especially with IoT, which stands for Internet of Things. And you'll begin to hear and see that, which means all every device, your blender, your refrigerator will have Internet connectivity. Um, it's it's detrimental. I really don't have a whole foolproof answer, but I know that if you take just some simple steps as far as setting notifications on um, devices, as far as when you log into a device, setting up uh, multi-factor authentication. So when you do log into a, a device, you have to have a special number to get into the account, as well as with a strong password that's 12 characters or longer. Um, that's about you know, and maybe, you know, an uh, antivirus and a firewall, but as Miss, um, as the, the Miss Breeze hit on, there's no 100% way to foolproof yourself, but the Russia thing is just, it's so sensitive. I don't, it, whatever that they launch, I'm sure we'll have some, some uh, countermeasure, but man, 
Uh, what you're seeing now has been going on for the past five years. World War Three has been going on. Um, mm-hmm. People attacking different digital assets mm-hmm. all around mm-hmm. the world and stealing information. So this isn't anything yeah. new. You you guys are kind of just hearing about it. Um, but I will say this. There are far more uh, internet able devices now than there were five years ago. So um, uh, just like me and you, they could launch an attack and it could mess up me and your phone. They could do an EMP, which is an electric magnetic post that will knock out every device that's not within a, um, a metal box. Mm-hmm. And, and they're targeting the government, but now they just brought down a power grid. You know what I mean? And they've now that's affecting, um, I'll bring up the Keystone Pipeline. I don't know if you, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the, maybe six months ago, the gas pipeline on the Eastern shore, Eastern seaboard had got yeah. hot. Um, yeah. That was due to uh, ICS system, which stands for industrial control systems. These things control our waterways, bridges. These things control industrial equipment that is vital to our safety, our life. And someone hacked it, you know, and this is a legacy system. And just imagine that they, you know, they ransomware attacked this um, this gas pipeline and look at look what it did. So imagine we can't use our phone or we can't, I have an electric car, my car won't turn on, you know? So it, it's, it's a very serious and, and sensitive subject. Um, and I hope I was able to bring awareness to it and just yeah. make people just second guess when they're about to click on something like, hey, I seen that guy on the truth, speak the truth. All right, let me let me look at this link. Is it is there a lock on the website when I go to it? Maybe you'll check the certificate. Maybe you'll hover over it. I don't know. Maybe you'll just pause. And that's just what I'm hoping uh, this talk here today today did. I have I have two things. Okay. Um, and okay, then I got Bree, I'm gonna let you close us out, Bree. I'm gonna let you close this session out. Go ahead, Bree. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, share with you guys an experience that um my my uh, first ex-husband had when we were together uh, with uh, Best Buy, we took our laptop to the Geek Squad. And you know, when you log onto your laptop and everything for your bank information, it saves all that information, all that passcode and stuff into something. So when we took it there, um, the guy that was working on, on the laptop, he created a bank account of his own. And the dummy, I mean, he was he was so smart that he was dumb. But he was smart enough to create the account, but dumb enough to use his own information, like his real real name and everything, and transfer to his actual bank. So what he did was he received the information, the passcodes and bank information from my ex-husband's account, transferred $5,000 from his account. He created an account with his name Mm -hmm. under my ex-husband's account, transferred that $5,000 into his account using his own bank and so that's how we end up getting the money back because he led us to his bank and his bank had it in that account so that was a smart but dumb person and then another thing as far as like um hackers and stuff if you have a smart tv you do know hackers can actually watch you through your tv wow so they teach us that they teach us that in our trainings in our security trainings so they're saying if you have a smart tv like at at night or whatever if you getting dressed or whatever it's best to put a sheet if you have uh, you know put a sheet over your tv i ain't putting a sheet over nothing they want to look at something i'm gonna give them something to look at (laughs) but anyway i ain't got no sense y'all but anyway but um but 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 at first, I was kind of nervous and scared about it because all the TVs in my house are smart TVs. So, I mean, I'm not going to put a sheet over. I'm not going to feel like a prisoner in my own home. So, mm-hmm. but it is what it is. They say if you have a smart TV, hackers can actually be watching you sleep. They can watch you get dressed or whatever you, activity you're doing in your house. They can see that. So, a, we all have to, be, we have to be aware of that, too, of uh, smart TVs. So, we need a, you need to get a camera cover. I sell camera covers. I was just highlighting to Mr. Uh, Jacquez before he got on. I, he was like, I couldn't see you. And I said, I had my camera cover on. And he enabled his camera that basically cuts the camera off so and puts a picture up. But I'm like, 
that can still be in an able right. on in the back end, that's on my you don't even though. know it, so but what oh. camera cover am i gonna put on my tv i don't know i don't even know where my camera is they can look at you directly through your screen that's why they asked us to put a sheet over our tvs Wow. Well, how am I going to put a that. camera cover over my TV? I don't even know what a camera is on my TVs and stuff, but I know on my laptop, yes, I can. Well, this one has a built-in camera, so but I still can put something over over my camera, like like right now right. you can't see me, but I can I can cover that, but I can't cover my TV unless it's you know like they say use a sheet. So, but um, mm. like I that was that was my whole point of saying. We can't stop hackers. No matter what we try or whatever, hackers gonna be hackers. They gonna people. These people get paid to do this. So it's I don't, like I don't. I know. can't. I can't. I can't let us lead. Let uh, take off with that. That's. I don't think. I don't agree with that statement. I do think that there's something we can do. Um, Why haven't I we do done think, it? Like you can't 100. You can't 100 prevent. 100% prevent someone from breaking into your home, but you can put locks on the doors. You can buy a gun. You can, um, and, and, um, you know, install security cameras. You can install the best security locks, but that don't guarantee that your house is going to be 100% safe. So there are things exactly. that we can do that are proactive. I just don't want the narrative to be because too many times I see this with CEOs of small businesses, particularly, oh, we we can't do anything to stop the attacker. So I'm not going to worry about it. That that's not the right attitude. You know, that's not the right attitude. OK, and you we need right, more than but there's no guarantee one annual training. Yeah, Dante, we're going to have to bring you back for a second try, man. This is this has been very. <laughs> this has been you and Bree. In fact, this has been very educational. I'm quite sure that that. Uh, um, CJ and Gary and Lawrence and Jacques all have gotten some knowledge. I've gotten some knowledge. I, I just want everybody to remember, man, this this is very dangerous. I if I I'd stop if numbers I don't recognize, I don't I don't answer them. Something come on my computer, I click it right off. I'm kind of trying to protect myself in some yeah. kind of way. I know there's probably some deeper stuff that I can do, but uh, Dante, we got to have you back, man. Thank you so much for taking time you. out of your schedule, man, uh, to come to be with us. We want to stay you, around, Dante. We're going to be talking about some other great things. Uh, I want to move right now. I want to talk about, man, a guy that's really been 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 speaking up, man, and, and, and talking about the issues in the Black community, man, where, you know, a lot of people just go around the edges. You know, I don't go around the edges. And remember now, anytime I call your name here on Speak the Truth, and you want equal time, you got equal time. So we ain't hiding from nobody. Understand that. So, you know, when I, when all this stuff came up, and I've been with this doctor for 20 years, man, 20 years. And he let people come in from Kaiser Permanente and say, hey, we're taking over from Medicare. You understand? This Medicare has been been good to me, so why would I want to switch from Medicare to Kaiser Permanente where well, you go charge me $174 a visit, man, and you can get pissed off at me and dismiss me from your practice? Brother, something is wrong with you. It's not wrong with Carl Bell. I want to talk about Cory Booker. I don't know if any of y'all been keeping up with Cory Booker, man, and the stances that he's been taking uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the nomination of the Supreme Court, uh, new Supreme Court Justice uh, Brown Jackson, man. He, I just recently saw him on Bill Mayer, and he was talking about the racism across America and and the thing that he had been doing with the black farmer, man. I have, man, I had, I take my hat off to Cory Booker, man. He has been outstanding. And just think if we had all the members of the Congressional Black Caucus. You know what I'm saying? Stand up the way that this brother is standing up. It wouldn't be no Bill Sack and all the rest of this stuff, man. So I want to bring that to your attention. I don't know if Gary had an opportunity to find anything on Cory Booker or not, but I just wanted you to hear something on Cory. Do you find anything, Gary? Yeah. Uh, I, did, I didn't have time to find anything, okay. but I know we ran something with Cory on last week's show. Okay. And so people can do that and they can look at that because I didn't have time to pull up anything. Mm -hmm. And I know Mr. Lucas has it, uh, briefed us and updated us on uh, Booker's stance with the black farmers and other things. And, but he has been very vocal and he was 
the, the clip that we ran last week was uh, very emotional about how he was touched uh, during the Supreme Court um, hearings mm -hmm. with uh, Judge Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how about Lawrence? Brick, give us a brief summary of, of the things that Cory Booker has been doing because I we we get running out of time. And I got some special guests coming on that I want to get their piece in. Go ahead, Lawrence. Uh, just quickly, um, Cory Booker has been a very integral part in what we are doing at, as we identified the problem of Black farmers. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, when we first talked to her back in 2019 when she was running for president, she, she was told by many people who were looking for money through the heir's property to get funded through the government. Uh, she was told that heirs' property was the reason why black farmers are losing and have lost so much land, has lost uh, so much wealth in this country. Um, and the racism at the, because not only um, it was done because, not because of heir property, but because of uh, what was going on in the county committee system and the systemic racism uh, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Administration after administration, president after president, Congress after Congress have sat and watched this thing unfold. Now, what, uh, what um, Elizabeth Warren did, she came up with a plan. She, she sat and talked to us. Uh, night after night, we talked to her staff, two, three, four, five, and six people at a time working on this issue and wanted to know what the real truth was. I, I wish that some of our black leaders uh, would have done and it should be doing the same thing. But now what Cory Booker did, he heard about this. And when we contacted him, uh, he got on the issue of the black farmer because he has a close association with Bernie Sanders as well as Elizabeth Warren. She came up with a plan. Booker took the plan and came up with what we know uh, it was his BBB, Buy Back Better Act. Um, she gave the, the plan to Cory Booker and he ran with it and got it passed. And I would say that there's been no other congressman to take on this daunting task the way he has. We had, um, now most people think that because of what um, uh, Reverend Warnock, Senator Reverend Warnock did, uh, what R Warnock did was because Booker shared a piece of the legislation which was passed in order to get him elected and show that he was interested in black people and black farmers. Uh, I say that he's fallen far short of that uh, commitment as we as we moved into 2021 and now 2022. So I would say that one of the prime supporters on, from the Black Caucus that has done more, uh, I would say, physically, verbally, and otherwise to support Black farmers is in fact Cory Booker. But we have to always remember when you have to, because of politics and because of the Democratic Party and the way they manipulate and control, we have to stay on and make sure that he does what he started to do and continue to support Black farmers to this day. So we cannot afford to step back, but he's done an excellent job, Harold. Excellent, excellent, man, excellent. I just want to say, man, I take my hat off to him, man. As many of you know, I've been, I've dealt with, Across the aisle with politicians, man, since 1968, man. And I tell you, man, to see this brother step up, man, I don't know of anyone else doing this era in my lifetime that has stepped up like Cory Booker and say, hey, I'm going to call it exactly like I see it. And that's exactly what he's been doing. One other thing I want to uh, uh, get on, take a look at. I don't know if my guest is here or not, but I was looking for uh, my man OJ McGee out of uh, North Carolina to talk about March Madness, but I know we got our, our man, uh, CJ here. 
Uh, CJ, why don't you come on in and tell us how Mad March Madness has gone completely crazy, how Little St. Peter's got all the way to the Sweet 16, and just yesterday, the great Mike Krzyzewski was knocked out by Hubert Brown, who used to play uh, for um, a Duke, and now they're heading into the Final Four. Give us a little summary background on, on what's happening with March, March Madness, uh, CJ. CJ, are you still there? Gary? McGee is there. Also. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, there you go. There. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, CJ. I'm here. Yeah, so um, this is why we love March Madness. It's just been um, unpredictable in that tournament setting where uh, one game is all it takes. So it doesn't matter you know, how prestigious you are, how many five star recruits you have, how much money your school has. It, it's all, it all comes down to one game and a lot of pressure for these young men. So. Yeah, you see a team like St. Peter's that make a magical run. They've been knocked out now, but for them to get to the Elite Eight was pretty crazy. You know, they've knocked out some really established schools, schools that have bigger, uh, bigger practice gyms in their, their actual uh, arena that they play in, in St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, a team that buys in, um, you know, kids that are unselfish, they're not worried about their draft stock. They're not worried about this. They're just playing for each other. They're playing hard, and then you, you get those big upsets. And as you said, Coach K – is finally uh, riding off in the sunset after a thriller between Duke and North Carolina last night. Classic all-time all -time game. Some right. Questionable calls, but definitely right. um, to see uh, Coach K go out like that to a rival was definitely pretty big. Yeah, I know there are some, some riots and parades, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> down there in North Carolina to, to well, celebrate I, I that. Say but... this about, I, I want to say this. I was pulling for uh, Coach K. I met Coach K through uh, my legendary coach, a big house game at Winston-Salem State. Uh, really, really one of the legendary basketball coaches of all time. We were down uh, in Winston-Salem for homecoming one year, and Big House liked to take some of his, you know, some of the athletes that he paid favor to, he liked to take us to breakfast after, on a Sunday morning, and he'd take about eight of us, and we'd go to uh, K&W cafeteria. <laughs> and one morning we were sitting in there, and who walks over to the table but Coach K? And he comes over and he looks at us. He said, do you guys realize that you're having breakfast with one of the greatest coaches in the country? <laughs> Just like that. And Big House, uh, black or white, was leading the country at that time in, in, in basketball wins, man. And for Coach K to leave his family and come over to say at the Big House, I was a big fan of his. So House got up and went over to Coach K's family, who he knew, and, and spoke with them. I never forgot that. So I was... I was really pulling, pulling for them last night. But CJ, this will really tee me off. Hattie and I are getting ready for a watch the, the game on CBS. There's no more free TV. We couldn't find it on CBS. They done gave it over to uh, TNT or whoever. Yeah, we look at all. CBS, I think. Man, there's no more free television. These folks done sold us out, man, for a dollar bill. We sit here watching Hosey Wet. Uh, with Clint Eastwood last night while the game was going on, I was heartbroken. CJ, what's happening on that end, man? They, they just gave up free TV. Well, like I said, they're trying to make money. It's a new era for TV. So legacy TV and satellite TV is kind of dying off with streaming services. Most people just want to stream their stuff. So, you know, sports is wow. kind of in the middle of, of that transition where, you know, live sports is trying to figure out where it fits in between that transition to digital media subscriptions from legacy TV, you know, traditional TV. I actually did the same thing you did. I was looking mm -hmm. through all the local channels, like, what, what channel is the game on? And I had to look up, it was on TBS. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> the TBS started having basketball. But like you said, they're trying to, they're, they're trying to find a way to, to monetize and to survive the, the change of, from, from legacy media to new media. Yeah, I want to bring in my special guest from North Carolina. He's a native Washingtonian. Uh, he was born and raised in Southeast D.C., He's a graduate of Baloo High School, man. He worked in the broadcast industry at BET Network and Black College uh, Satellite Network here in the nation's capital, as well as holding positions as an adjunct professor and communications directors on the campuses of Morgan State, Florida A&M, and North Carolina State University. He's currently been on the campus of the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, over 20 years as an instructional media service manager and the chair of the Carolina Black Caucus and Public Address Announcer for
for the University of North Carolina women's basketball team, to name a few. I am so proud of this brother, man. I had nothing to do with his success, so don't think I'm trying to get it on his success, man. But I am so proud of you, OJ McGee, man. How you doing, my brother? I'm doing well, Brother Bell. Thank you so much, man. You make me sound important or something to hear come out your <laughs> mouth like that, man. <laughs> so I look, I was up here writing all this stuff about what Dante was talking about. He's throwing out all the acronyms, the ICF, the HBO, the make sure your notifications. I look, I'm, I'm writing fast, man. I'm like, man, I got to get this. So it's really a pleasure, man, and an honor to be here on uh, Speak the Truth. And that's what you all continue to do, speak the truth. But, 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 but let me first say, I just want to congratulate you, Brother Bell, on the 50 years of, uh, of your career inside sports. And, and not just sports. This is all that you have done uh, for over 50 years, not only in the Washington community, but just uh, your relationships far exceed the nation's capital. And uh, a lot of people don't know the stuff that you've done behind the scenes with your foundation, with the kids up there. Okay in the nation's capital. And uh, and then today is just a very good example. Like most people know you as this sports guy, but you are giving information to the community that we can use. And so, man, I really appreciate you. I love you, brother. And uh, it is an honor for me to be here uh, on your, on the show today. And, uh, and let me also say, I know you were going for Duke. I had to wear my UNC paraphernalia. I'm sorry, this is my work uniform. <laughs> so. Whoever paying the bills, that's what I'm going for. So, <laughs> they write the check, so that's what I'm going for right there. OJ, OJ, man, really, man, so glad to get you on. We got to bring you back, man, because there's so much information that you got, man. And, and I'm proud, man, that you are in a position where you keep reaching back, man. That's what it's all about, man. And that's what it's all about with me, man, to see young guys like yourself, man, Say, hey, Harold, man, congratulations. Thanks for all you've done. That's all awesome. so many people look for it. Just a thank you, man. But some of us, OJ, as you well know, you'd have been around and you'd have, you'd have seen it, man. I don't know how we forget, man, who we are and where we came from. And, and the mm. people like Martin Luther King, this is what uh, uh, Gary was saying. Uh, he, gave, he gave his life, man, for us to move ahead, man. So the things that I've done, I have not forgotten those people who died for me, man, died for me. So thank you so much, OJ, for being who you are. Hey, man, thank you. And I don't want to take up too much time. I know we want to get into talking about some, some basketball, but uh, the, the, the brother Lawrence, was, you all were talking about Cory Booker, and I just yeah. think this is real appropriate. He uses this African proverb that says, if you want to get somewhere fast, go alone. If you want to get somewhere far, go together. And you have definitely been getting there far because you have made it a community thing. So thank you. There wouldn't have been the James Browns, Stephen A. Smiths, or the uh, 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 Bomani Jones of the world if it wasn't a Harold, Bo uh, Harold Bell knocking down the door. So thank you, brother. So let's thank talk you. some b-ball. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, man, we, we got the Final Four coming up. And uh... – I want to go over to CJ and maybe to Gary to give us a little information who they think, who they take for in the Final Four, because uh, Kansas, is looking, of course, Maggie Linton is here, who was usually on here with us, uh, a Kansas girl. CJ, what do you think of, of, the, of uh, what's happening now with Kansas and who's going to come out the, the winner with uh, the University of North Carolina? Can, can Hubert uh, pull this off, CJ? I think he absolutely can pull it off. North Carolina has a really, really solid team, like I said there, and they're coming off the momentum of that big win against Duke. So um, I, I, I think I might go with North Carolina because of the momentum. Like I said, that was a war they just came out of but against Coach K and the and Duke, who has maybe four or five first round picks on that on that Duke team with Paulo Banchero, Wendell Moore. They've got Trevor Keels. They've got they've got players. So like to to knock that team out to come off that high, have that momentum. I think they've got a good chance to knock off Kansas, even though Kansas has got um, some 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 good players as well. They've got a couple of pro prospects and who are looking to be in the lottery as well. But mm -hmm. I, I'm going to go with North Carolina if it's going to go for my Gary, Gary, guys from the area, you got to highlight that. Oh, you got some guys from, from the area. Oh yeah, the team got, got about the, the, four the, players the, from here. Yeah, yeah. I, I know Kills who went to. Uh, did he go to Paul the Six? I think. 
Yep, him and yeah. Jeremy Roach. Him and yeah, Jeremy, Jeremy Roach. Roach. Right up at, what's that, Leesburg up that way yep. somewhere, DMV right? DMV product. That's DMV right, that's product right. On national that's TV. Right. <laughs> okay, right. Darren. Who you no, like give there? it back. Give, give it back to OJ. Give it back to OJ. Okay, OJ. OJ. Well, we know OJ like uh, who we well, like. That's I'm true. Yeah. Well, that's true. We know well, look, we like. well, hold on. I'm a big fan of objective, brother. Come on now. I'm going okay, I'm I'm to keep it real. I, you didn't okay. ask who I wanted to win, right? Uh -huh. You asked what I thought of it, right? <laughs> Go <laughs> so, ahead, OJ. Uh, no, no, look, I do agree with CJ uh, about uh, particularly UNC. Uh, the Tar Heels have been playing the best basketball at the right time in the tournament. Uh, mm -hmm. Their guard play uh, between, uh, what's my man named, R.J. Davis and, of course, Caleb Love. Right now, they're like the best uh, uh, guard tandem right now in the NCAA. Uh, what I will say is that uh, the thing that worries me, I want both teams, both teams really mirror each other. Both teams really started off a little slow this year. Tar Heels were a little slower than Kentucky. I mean, I'm sorry, not Kentucky, Kansas. I think Kentucky beat both of them. And Kentucky beat the Bricks <laughs> off of UNC early, I know. Right. Um, but, but again, they're both catching fire at the right time. The thing that worries me about UNC tomorrow, I mean, uh, yeah, tomorrow, is that uh, I don't know to what extent Baycott, Baycott's injury is. He went down with a little ankle injury last night. He he had double double. He had twenty rebounds last night, wow. and uh, so I'm 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 concerned. I'm a little concerned about that. Um, I don't know if Kansas can keep hitting that three at the clip that they were doing last night against Villanova, but they were on, particularly that brother uh, Abaji. Yeah, he, I mean, he was like six for seven from outside the arc, and so if he can keep that up, that's going to be difficult. I do think it's going to be a good game. Um, the other thing that really worries me, particularly if you're down here in this neck of the woods, is that uh, my hope is that everything wasn't spent on last night's game. I don't want to be a prisoner of the moment, but last night's game was – it was a phenomenal game, and uh, no matter who won that game. But down here, when UNC and Duke get together, it's like a championship game in itself. And so my hope is that because, of course – they paying the bills. My <laughs> hope is that UNC didn't spend all that championship play in the semifinals against Duke and that they can continue to build on it, as CJ said, uh, in the championship uh, tomorrow night. So I think it's going to be a good game, but, 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 but there's some things that concern me uh, about where UNC is right now, particularly with that injury and about where mentally they are, you know, so. Yeah. Oh, OJ, since we got you here, and I hope the, everybody else understands exactly where I'm coming from, I want to take advantage uh, of your knowledge, especially being a media person, man, and the media controls the image that goes out over these TV screens and, I mean, the radios, the talk shows. I want to, I'm, I want to bring something to everybody's attention. The National Black Network, which was a black cable station went out of business they went out of business man and i was pulling for the national black network because of my relationship with jc watts gary could we run a little piece on jc watts and my interview with him back in the day yes sir let's do this uh let's see here we go and uh because uh you know, I think that many people do have hangups with with being black and and being uh, Republican, and and it's interesting that no one ever references any of my colleagues as the white Democrat or the white Republican or even the black Democrat. But when it comes to me, they they reference the black Republican. I believe we need diversity in all communities. Uh, no one ever jumps on the white community for being Republican and Democrat and independent, but when the black community says uh, we don't see the world the same as, as this person or this person or this person, when we try to add some diversity, uh, people have, have hang-ups about that. If they can't pigeonhole you, mm -hmm. then they, they have difficulties with that. And uh, I believe it's important going into the 21st century 
uh, that we explore all of our options, all of our opportunities. And I'm a firm believer that in the Republican Party, uh, you know, we, we, I think there's a lot of room for us to grow and a lot of room for us to, to reach out. And, and I don't believe we'll ever become the majority party until we can attract those who traditionally have never supported our cause or hadn't for the last 60, 65 years, and that's in the minority community. If we can attract minorities, we can become uh, the majority party. So we've got some work to do there, and I recognize that and, and look forward to uh, trying to help in that effort. We're having a crisis okay. in, in many of our communities uh, around it? the country as far as our children. That was an interview that I did with uh, J.C. Watson in 1994, man. And uh, uh, outstanding brother, have a lot of great respect for him. But when I saw the National Black Network, and, and what it was about to do. But then I saw on his board, there were the usual suspects. And that right there kind of turned me off, you understand? And he had uh, one of the NFL owners, I think from the Jacksonville Jaguars, put up $10 million, man, to help. Where were the other black folks, man, in trying to keep this important outlet, this important vehicle afloat? OJ, come on in on that. Well, I mean, I think you're, you're right. Uh, I hadn't heard that they are, I guess, essentially uh, going out of business. I remember yeah. when J.C. Watt had came, come down to Florida A&M down in Tallahassee when he first started having this vision for the Black News Network. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, that's a sad thing to hear. I do think that, um, you know, there's some self-reflection that has to go on with that as well. And so I don't even know how many people in our community actually knew there was a black news network? Uh, you know what I mean? And so right. that, 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 I, and, and, you know, I don't, whatever your politics are, um, the content that he was throwing, you know, that the network was throwing out was good content because it was from our perspective. And I remember when I worked at BET, it was one of the criticisms that we used to get a lot because they, you know, when Bob Johnson first started, it was just all these music videos, right? And mm -hmm. then they started trying to open up doing things with Tavis Smiley and some other, you know, more meaningful content. And I just thought, you know, with this, uh, the Black News Network, it was, it was getting to that. So, uh, and I, I hear you a little bit alluding to, hey, look, we gotta pull our resources together on things like this. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many different athletes out there who are multi-million dollar athletes and things of that nature. My hope is that J.C. Watts, I remember that brother when he was quarterbacking for Oklahoma back Hell in the day, yeah, Oklahoma right. Sooners, run, running that wishbone. So um, mm -hmm. my hope is that there's some, there could be some type of connection to help uh, to, to bring this back uh, and, and hold it afloat. Uh, because if nothing else, as you said, the media and the perceptions that we either throw out there or that we receive is really important. Right. I got another brother, I hope he's still out there, that I brought on. I want to bring him on because he's talking about another uh, black athlete out of Washington, D.C., who went on to do some great things at Dunbar High School, where he's an All-American basketball player. But this brother and I have been working together for decades out in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, which is his hometown. Uh, he's a, a legend when it comes to his work with children and senior citizens. Uh, he has seen the struggle up close and personal, and he can usually be found here or, or sitting in with us. And I'm talking about uh, Michael Johnson. Michael, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How you doing? Hi, everybody. All right. How you doing, big brother? Michael, hey, I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about uh, Daryl Prue. A lot of folks are not aware of what recently went down with this brother. Daryl was a former outstanding. Uh, player at Dunbar High School. He coached at Georgetown University with John Thompson's son. Then he took a high school uh, head coaching job out in uh, uh, Alexandria. And just recently, man, uh, he was doing a game over at Wakefield, man. And all of a sudden, you know, he, he, turned, he turned the basketball program around. And all of a sudden, somebody's hollering out of the stands about he couldn't know, he didn't know how to coach and call him all kinds of MFs and everything. And nobody said anything. He's looking for some help from his staff or from Wakefield or somebody. And he didn't want to see or uh, hear this, his students 
athletes continue to hear this abuse. So he just stepped around, stepped, stepped up into the stands and asked the guy, you know, what, what is going on, man? What, how can we solve this issue? Now, at first, I thought it was a racial thing because they were over at Wakefield, okay? As he turns to go back to the bench, somebody attacks him from behind and knocks him to the floor. It's all on tape, folks. And man, I had to call Michael. I said, Michael, what happened to this brother, man? Was that a racial thing? Come to find out, this man had the real story. Tell us about Daryl Prue, man, an outstanding coach and, and, and where he is now, uh, Michael. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm an alumnus of T.C. Williams, Nana's Elementary City High School. And I first met Daryl Prue when I had a young man that I used to coach named Tyrone Shaw. They played together in West Virginia. You know, okay. so I was excited when Daryl came over. Matter of fact, Daryl helped me with my son, uh, Jason Ingram, who was a 2001 All-Met as well from T.C. Wow. Williams. And on this day uh, in December, the season was like the second or third game of the season. And uh, they were playing Wakefield, which was a rivalry because really it was back in the old days, it was uh, Parker Gray High School and some of the guys from the Hill and Arlington. So when we went to T.C. Williams, it was a big rivalry, always been. And Darrell was basically coaching the kids and he had this, uh, one of the young men on his team, uncle, sit, sit behind the bench. And uh, it was a very hotly contested game. And, you know, the uncle felt as though that his nephew, who really, if I was a coach, wouldn't have been on the team because he really he couldn't play, just to be honest with y'all. Uh, he kept telling, shouting at Daryl to, you know, put my nephew in the game, MF, you know, and start cussing at Daryl. And then it escalated to where he was calling the coach uh sorry you know ML. yeah and uh so at the halftime daryl just got up and just went over and said hey, look man let the kids because i'm sitting like four rows back mm -hmm. hey man won't you let the kids play the game anything you have to say to me you can say after the game but right now with all this cussing and everything that you're doing you're first of all you're hurting your nephew because he's confused you're hurting the other kids because they're now complaining about, you know, why is uh, Trayvon's uncle in the back, you know, cussing like this, right? So when Daryl had his back turned, the kid's father came across the floor mm. and hit Daryl, stole Daryl, you know? And at this time, of course, Daryl goes to defend himself and we all rushed down to break it up with the AD and everybody. So once it was broken up, uh, my concern was number one, as I approached his father was like, you know, you was dead wrong. My other job is that I work with law enforcement and I do uh, I'm community outreach, but I do what they call CIT training, which is crisis intervention. So my first impression was to tell this guy, hey, man, you know, you out of control. You know, you hit this man. And if you was in Alexandria, you would have been arrested. I would have had him arrested. And that's what we couldn't understand why Arlington County did not place this parent under arrest for assault. You know, so all the blame went on Daryl because he went up in the stand. But like I was telling the administrators, I'm on the uh, uh, Alexander Athletic Hall of Fame committee is that, hey, you know, all he told the guy was, hey, man, just pipe down. You know, you can talk to me after the game. They rushed the judgment, not charging the parent, didn't want the kid penalized at all anyway, but they penalized Daryl. They suspended Daryl from coaching, you know, and Daryl didn't file an appeal. They just had a hearing. And just a week ago, they pretty much concluded that Daryl did nothing wrong. But Daryl, you know, feeling the pressure, he resigned. And we was trying to talk him out of it, but he was like, I'm fed up with it. And I said, hey, Daryl, you know, I understand. I'll coach AAU kids. I'll coach uh, some of the kids in the city. And my biggest disappointment was that I never had to deal with people in the stands I guess because I was local home, homegrown when I coached T.C. Williams uh, in the summer leagues and uh, at Georgetown. I, I just guess the guys knew that I wasn't going to take that kind of abuse anyway. Mm -hmm. But for him to have to take that abuse, I saw it not being that, even though he wasn't from Alexandria, that respect should have been showed to Daryl. Um, mm -hmm. They basically penalized Daryl without penalizing their parent for coming up hitting Daryl. 
Uh, and to this day, uh, I've made it my point that this guy could not coach because he used to volunteer coach rec league basketball. I stepped in and told him that he cannot coach any kid under Alexander Department of Recreation. He can't coach any team, you know? And I had to do that because I told him, first of all, what he did uh, shouldn't have been done around those kids because all that does is generate uh, that black on black thing, you know, that mm -hmm. we don't know how to conduct ourselves. And what brought it back to home, Harold, when you called me, I instantly went to Will Smith and Chris Rock and how they look on a national stage. But I'm saying on a, on a lower stage, how this looked to our kids in this community. And with those whites that were sitting there saying, hey, look at these black coaches and look at these black parents. They don't know how to conduct themselves. Mm -hmm. And I told Daryl, you know, to hang in there, but Daryl pretty much said he was fed up and, and tired. And I don't blame him because he did turn that program around. He took teams and players that I would have cut or couldn't even make the team when I was coming up and made them winners. I mean, they won a couple of uh, Patriot District titles under Daryl, you know, with underachievement, underachieving athletes that probably couldn't make anybody else's team. So that's the effort and the work ethic that he put into them to bring them to that level, you know, yeah. and I don't know where he's at uh, to this day. I did okay. chat with him about a month ago. And he was just saying he was just chilling, you know. Yeah. But I thought well, that look, was man. look, man. Thank you, Michael, so, for, so much for taking time out to be here and kind of bring us up to date. We're gonna follow up on 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 Daryl Prue because we got to protect strong black young men like that, man, who are making a difference in our community. We can't let him just fall aside. So, so Michael, thank you so much. I got one more guest. I'm gonna give one minute, uh, my man, uh, uh, Coy. Uh, uh, Lowsome, are you Corey? Are you out there? I want you to tell us about Corey. Is a comedian. He's opened up for uh, Aretha Franklin, man. Uh, he's traveled the world as a comedian, and he wanted to say something about the Chris Rock and the Will Smith thing. And he's a comedian that has to go on stage, and he has another perspective. Corey, are you there? Corey probably got time. Well, that way, that way, we got to get Gary. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dante. Thank you. He's on, Harold. Lauren. He's, he, on Harold. he's on. He's on. He's, oh, he's on. He's on. Oh, okay. Coy, come on on, Coy. Yeah, how you, how you doing there? Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, I think everybody said everything that was, that was supposed to be said. However, you look at it, you know, me being on stage. Look. I think we just, we, we're in a different world, huh? We're in a different world. People are just so sensitive about everything. They're so sensitive. Look, if you're going to sit in front, of the, in front of the stage, then uh, I'm not saying that you're, you're an easy target, but, I mean, it's all in fun. At the end of the day, it's all in fun. Uh, if, if you're offended, then, you know, you, you shouldn't be at the comedy club. You shouldn't be at the event. Uh, Here's the deal, folks. I've been in situations where I was actually overseas. I performed overseas. And uh, there was this like European Rocky Four type of guy. And I'm sitting here talking about smart cars. Smart cars hadn't come to the US yet. So I'm talking about smart cars and I have this whole 10 minute set routine, which was funny. And uh, the guy walks on stage, he walks on stage. And he says, he shows me his keys and he says, I have a smart car. And I said, okay, so where did you park it? In your pocket? I mean, you know, for him to have the audacity to come on stage and be offended because I'm talking about the car he drives, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did tell him, look, if you're not in showbiz, then you need to get off the stage. I, uh, I apparently had another comedian that was with us on tour. Now, he said he knew ninjutsu, which I believed him. But at the end of the day, folks, you know, it is, it, you just, if you're a comic and you just have to be mindful of who you speak to in that audience, because if they don't come up to you on stage like, like uh, Big Willie style, they might meet you at the, in the alley or in the parking lot. If, if you don't have a, a, another gig, you know what I'm saying? So me as a comic, I'm a nice guy. I, I do clean comedy. But 
you know, if you come in late to the show, you're an easy target. Am I making okay, sense? Okay, Corey, we got to get out of here. We're going to bring you back, my brother. We're going to bring you back and give you All some right. equal time, man. Thanks, everybody, man, for participating. Bree, hey, Bree, come back. Gary, uh, I'll close us out, Gary. All CJ, right, here's thanks. how we're going to do it. We're out. Be we safe. Out. <laughs> See you next yeah. week. Man, we <laughs> will. Thank you. Great show, man. Great show. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Bree. And, of course, uh, OJ, OJ, my man, OJ down there at the University of North Carolina. Happy, happy birthday. Congratulations. Thank you, Lawrence. 50 Thank years, you, Lawrence. Long happy time. Martin Luther King. Yep. That's right, man. Good gracious. Thank you, Lawrence.